Thanks, Dr. Barry. So just to give a brief outline of the talk, uh, we'll start briefly about how to evaluate bone loss for planning your revision, specifically on the femoral side, how to classify that bone loss, and how to use that classification system to really plan what stems uh, are available for use. When evaluating the bone loss, I think um, this is pretty, pretty straightforward, but AP and lateral radiographs of the pelvis and the hip, um, specifically focused on the femur, I think lateral radiographs of the cross table uh, at the hip and then lateral radiographs of the femur can be really helpful. We kind of heard in the last talk um, about the necessity sometimes for osteotomy to take out deformity. And if you look at the x-ray on the screen, you can see that that uh, bow on the femur is going to make it pretty hard if you don't do an anterior-based osteotomy. I think sequential films can be helpful in all, all these uh, revision cases, planning for the femoral defect. And then CT scan I occasionally will use uh, when planning for femoral reconstruction. The times that I do uh, lean heavily on CT scan is if you had really bad bone loss, um, you're really not sure if you have supportive uh, femur at all, and then planning through deformity. It's also helpful, I think, in the setting of fractures in the case of femoral perforations like you see here. So for this patient, the femoral uh, CT scan does show that there's definitively no support of femur throughout this canal, and it helps you guide your stem selection, you know, pushes you away from some, some options. The classification of femoral bone loss, I think uh, almost everybody's using the Paprosky system, uh, described almost 20 years ago now from Rush. We'll kind of go through these settings. So Paprosky type 1 femoral bone loss really have an intact femoral diaphysis really do not have a whole lot of metaphyseal bone loss, uh, cases like you see here. Occasionally with the smaller proximate coated stems, you'll have Paprosky type 1 femur. Type 2, uh, these patients again have an intact femoral diaphysis like you see in the x-ray. It has a little more uh, cancellous metaphyseal bone loss. So you're starting to think more about getting distal fixation. For type 3, which is broken down into subtypes A and B, uh, the bone loss starts to extend into the diaphysis. You can see in this uh, fully coated stem, uh, you start to have stress shielding proximally, and maybe your diaphysis, once you get the stem out, you're gonna have three or four centimeters left uh, with which to get a revision stem to stick. And then Paprosky type four femoral bone loss, this is the extensive uh, loss throughout the bone, a widened femoral canal. Uh, you see this loose spacer stem that's been in place for years. It's got a windshield wiper distally. Uh, you can imagine there is no supportive femoral bone with which to, to try a revision stem. So femoral stem options, we'll try to give an overview for each type. I think proximally porous coated, either Riemann brooch, uh, most people would use Riemann brooch if you're doing this. I think it's rare indication for revision total hip. Uh, this goes back to the Paprosky 1 type femur where you can really rely on after getting the stem or the femoral component out that you're going to have enough bone uh, proximally to end grow with this type design. I think in my practice, you use this for a conversion total hips from resurfacing, uh, occasionally very small press fit femoral components. And then the most setting that I've used this in is in the acute revision. The patient has a periprosthetic fracture, they had a, a porous coated stem that you can take out and cable and then you can place back down. I think cemented stems still have a role in revision, um, revision femoral side. I think you can use it in almost any classification of bone loss, and there are a bunch of different techniques that people will use. It's much more commonly used outside of the United States. Uh, you can use it within the existing cement mantle uh, if you have a loose femoral component, but you have good uh, host bone to cement fixation. You can also use it with impaction grafting. And the patient on the right, the patient had a loose femoral stem for several years, presented after an acute fall and inability to bear weight. CT scan showed a small fracture. You can pull that stem out from the top, remove that broken cement, and then uh, use another cemented stem for this 90-year-old patient. I think monoblock tapered stems can be used, um, Paprosky 1 through 3 classified femoral bone loss. I think the, the indication for these, you can almost use them in, in almost any revision. There's some benefits involving the rigid straight reamers. You have flutes that will engage the diaphyseal bone. Um, these stems almost always have an on-growth component, and I think it's a great option for proximal periprosthetic fractures. I think it's a good option for the younger patient that might um, stress a modular junction over 30 or 40 years of wear. Modular fluted tapered stems, I think these are the workhorse of revision total hip. I think these can be used, I say Paprosky 1 through 3. Uh, we heard in the last talk, occasionally we will try to push them for Paprosky 4 uh, on rare indications. I've done it a few times. Um, 
the risk of these stems subsidence. I think you, if you're going to put in a, a modular fluted tapered stem, you really have to ream up that diaphyseal bone, get engagement of those distal flutes, and then proximal body gives you a strength to have offset and length options. The modularity gives you versatility, makes the reconstruction a little easier to get your um, offset and length options bat, but it also has a weak point and potential for um, trunnion and, and metallosis issues. Extensively porous coated stem, I think also you could use these extended out to a Poprosky 4. You could use them in any indication for femoral revision. Uh, most of these systems involve rigid straight reamers and then broaching to get a fit. You get ingrowth throughout the length of the stem, which can be a benefit in patients with, um, with bad bone. I think in the long term, stress shielding causes problems, and we see that um, in many patients. I think endoprosthesis, talking about proximal femur and then extending to total femur and others, really should only be used in the case of catastrophic uh, bone loss and, and a loss of a supportive canal. So you have both cementless and cemented options. I think it's pretty uncommon if you're, if you're moving to this type of stem to use a press fit or a cementless stem designed distally. You look at the patient on the right. This is the patient from the CT scan earlier. There's no supportive femur. Uh, she has a prior strut graft, which has become most of the supportive canal laterally. It's really hard to get fixation in this without a cemented option, and none of the bone proximally is offering anything. Really high risk of instability, and then aseptic loosening in the long term with these patients. Total femur replacement. Uh, these, I think, the only indication for Poprosky 4 type femur, uh, interprosthetic fractures, and patients that have had fractures of both sides. High rate of instability with these cases, high rate of aseptic loosening, um, as well as uh, infection. So there are a few surgeries that went between the x-ray on the left and the x-ray on the right. This patient showed up with 10 years of this spacer with subsidence, loosening throughout the entire femur, uh, had a spacer placed with a long kind of proximal femur spacer that stayed infected, ended up with this um, spacer use of a total femur replacement. And the last uh, option, I think, for femoral reconstruction would be an allograft prosthesis composite. I think this is for the uh, worse end of the spectrum, Poprosky 3B or 4 femurs. Uh, involves using a femoral allograft, an entire uh, cadaver femoral allograft with a long cemented stem. The distal femoral bone that's remaining in this patient, uh, you can't tell, um, maybe has about four inches of femur left above the knee. That bone is reamed, the graft is then prepared and then uh, impacted in as you would a stem. So we call that interception grafting. Uh, there are some good results with APC and, and some of the worst defects.